Welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online summit about conflict transformation that wants to explore pathways towards more regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva. I'm one of the hosts of the summit together with my colleague, which is here with us today also, Ben Roberts. Hi, Ben. Hello. And Eva Schoenfeld, who couldn't be with us today. And we have the pleasure of uh, holding a conversation with Joe Brewer. Welcome, Joe. Hey, Nuno. Hello, Ben. It's lovely to see you both. Welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for having the time to have this conversation with us. Joe has, been, has a unique background in physics, math, philosophy, atmospheric science, complexity research, and cognitive linguistics. So you really bring a huge diversity of, of knowledge fields into, into place. More than a decade ago, you left the academy to do some sort of trailblazing path of um, exploring other possibilities with uh, fellow practitioners and researchers. And um, you've been, I think, touching on in exploring some of the most intractable problems of our times and trying to find a way, a way forward. Um, in that, you've been an active member of the Center for Complex Systems Research on the University of Illinois, studying pattern formation in physical and social systems with George Lakoff. Uh, you've been at the Rock, Rock Ridge Institute in Berkeley, analyzing political discourse, revealing structures of meaning in human language. Then you start to, to work um, on uh, co cognitive policy works. Later on, you worked with Laszlo Karafiath on uh, the new field of cultural design, which culminated in the birth of Culture to Incorporated. You've been doing many, many things. You were involved with the rules, looking for other narratives and, and exposing some of the limitations of the dominant views around uh, issues like um, how we, we write down the, the Millennium Development Goals and things like that, which I think were really uh, fundamental work to expose some of the shortcomings of those global responses to the predicaments we are in. So I'm so happy to welcome you. You are hosting a community these days of uh, regenerative uh, practitioners and people interested in doing regeneration. We love to hear about that, but for, for, as a starter, it would be great to really hear a bit of your journey and how, how that journey has been, uh, what has happening that led you to do the work you are doing today. Yeah, I think a good way for me to start telling my story today that's relevant to this summit is to share a long-standing struggle that I had as a child throughout my childhood that I think in many ways has shaped what I'm doing now. And that is that I was one of those kids that grew up on a farm in the country where I didn't relate to the people around me and felt really isolated and alone. And so I struggled with depression. I had what I like to call suicidal feelings, which is that I didn't intend to kill myself but I had the feeling that it would be nice if I chose to. And I struggled with that for a long period of time. Uh, say between the ages of around 10 years old and 18 years old. And the, the theme underlying it was this question of whether or not I was human. As I was surrounded by people in a dysfunctional culture, and I just saw a lot of bullying behavior and people being mean to each other. And I thought, well, if this is what the humans are, am I one of them? And of course, I had a lot of um, you know, difficulties in my personal life around family and, and in the community itself that placed me in this isolated position. But it sort of opened me up to an inquiry about whether or not humans are good, whether or not humans are a beneficial part of their environment. And, um, and really coming from the dark places of trauma to feel into that. And I look back now when I'm in my you know, I'm entering my mid 40s and I have decades of struggle with this question. And what I found is that there's a way to separate out sort of the good, the bad and the ugly of being human and, um, and recognize how powerfully beautiful we are as human beings if we're able to be in sacred relationships and how destructive and harmful we can be to everything, including ourselves, if we don't have those sacred relationships. So this, um, this shaped the way that I went to 
you know, elementary and high school as a, a sort of an intellectually oriented kid in an anti-intellectual culture. Um, for those who are familiar with the Midwestern United States, I grew up in a small town in Missouri. And so there's a lot of anti-intellectualism there. Also a lot of sexism and racism and things that painted my picture of humans being bad by being immersed in that. And, um, and so that meant that I was the kid that was destined to be valedictorian by the end of seventh grade, because I was the only one still getting straight A's. And so instead of thinking of myself as smart, I saw myself as strange. Like I was the one that no one could relate to and it, it caused me pain to be the smart kid. And that really created a place of humility for my difference. I didn't feel better than other people. I felt like I was handicapped. I was burdened with a perspective that caused me pain and made me different. So you can already see the theme of managing conflict is so relevant to that, that orientation in life. And when I went to college, I was the first in my family to go to college because I grew up in a working class poverty background. And, um, and I had a full ride academic scholarship. So four years, completely paid for, study whatever I want. And so instead of doing what a lot of people were doing in the late 1990s, which was treating college like job training for corporate life, um, which we now see in retrospect as a terrible thing that's happened to universities, it was really just getting started in the mid 90s, um, that I felt like I had four years of just free reign to walk around campus studying whatever I wanted I didn't care about getting a degree. It was like someone had given me the keys to the candy store, but the candy store was a library and professors and academic programs. And so I just, I also should say I was an insomniac at that time, which was part of the reason I was so depressed. So I was getting one or two hours of sleep per night and that made it really difficult to process my emotions. And that meant that I would attend all of my friends' classes with them as well as my own, and then do my homework in the middle of the night when everyone is sleeping. And I spent eight years at university, so I spent a long time in this mode of just being a sponge for whatever kind of knowledge I could find, and holding this question of whether humans are good or bad. And unbeknownst to me, I was going to have an accidental discovery, which was um, when I was studying complexity science and looking for a way to go to grad school studying it, I was actually in a physics graduate program, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, um, doing material science research. And we were doing biomimicry, although I didn't know that's what it was called at the time. We were taking polymers from plants and creating biodegradable plastics for what now is standard, like the dashboards of cars are all made from biodegradable plastics. I was in one of those research labs around the year 2000. And hated it because my research advisor, my professor, was kind of a jerk and had really bad social skills. And I just felt really neglected. And in the conflict of being in that bad relationship, which I think a lot of graduate students can relate to, another professor came from an atmospheric science department and gave a talk where his research studied clouds using satellites. And I was just blown away by two things. One was the earth is so beautiful from space. When you look at the earth through a satellite and you see these clouds, you see the land, it's just mesmerizing. I was having what psychologists call the overview effect, falling in love with the earth from a different perspective. And the second thing was that as a physicist, you know, trained in physics, I had been taught that all of the important questions had been solved well before I was born. And here I was stepping into the field of atmospheric science where they couldn't explain why rain forms so quickly in tropical storms, which so seemed to me to be a basic question that should have been figured out a long time ago. And what I was doing was looking into the face of complexity, that cloud formation for creating storms in the tropics is incredibly complex, but it's also an everyday experience. And so I was really struck philosophically by this, this domain. And, um, and so this is how I was able to hold philosophical inquiry while being a scientist, which made it possible for me to learn about climate change as an atmospheric scientist and see all of the philosophical problems with how the science and the policy was being developed. And um, that led me to a conversation with another friend who was studying a field at the time was brand new called cognitive anthropology of religion, which was taking cognitive science and doing anthropology field research to understand religion. 
which is this beautiful blend. This was again about 20 years ago. And so um, it was new at the time. And my friend told me, you know, this blend between philosophy and science and looking at climate change, there's a domain for that. They call it cognitive science. You know, you can study the human mind and how it works. And because I had never accepted any domain of inquiry, I just kept going. Dropped out of my PhD program and never finished it. Taught myself cognitive science and was able to write a really compelling uh, um, interview letter to the Rockridge Institute to say, I can do cognitive linguistics. I've never taken a single class in cognitive science, but I, uh, I understand the human mind pretty well and I'm ready to help. And it was this, again, this conflict management question of universities being so structured to make people basically minions of technical improvement in advanced fields, and that's what a PhD is. When actually I was doing a real PhD, I was being a philosopher of knowledge, which couldn't be done in a university. To this day, I don't have a PhD because each time I considered going back, there was a mismatch between the structure of my inquiry and the structure of university programs. And so I kept co-creating um, domains of academic research and advanced practice in the place where people in universities know there are pockets where this happens, but it is because they do it at odds with the larger structures of universities. And I've, I've lived in that paradoxical place all of my life. So, so I'll just stop here by saying that this sort of put me in this realm of finding answers to what makes humans good for the planet and what makes pathological human cultures bad for the planet, which is a really um, generative place for doing design work, which is how I found you, you, both of you as beautiful people who are in the same inquiry for all of your lives um, <laughs> to do this work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Joe. I, I think one of the things we, when we were preparing for this conversation that, that is really great chance to have you uh, on the summit is we, we've been talking a lot about the dynamics of somehow of inner personal conflict, of conflict between people and how also a bit trauma relates with that. And you've, you've also kind of... Uh, showcase that a bit with your journey and i think all of our journeys is somehow involving some level of, of trauma that we need to overcome and kind of shapes our lives but uh, another thing is you've been dedicating a lot of time to your journey but also through the reflections you do the philosoph philosophical inquiries and the, the reality observation and then analysis uh, around the the more Everything okay? We're still here. Yeah, okay, you're still there. Something happened here with the, um, with the, where are you guys? Uh, you're there. I'll, I'll cut the past this afterwards. Something happened, this, someone jumped on the, on, the, um, on the account, but it's okay, we can <laughs> continue. Uh, so this, you have this perspective of the more structural aspects we are in that kind of put us in a place where, uh, on one side, we keep stuck in dynamics of conflicts because of those structures in place. And on the other hand, they, the, they are the result of the kind of views, uh, world views and, and life views that, that created them. And we are kind of addressing them with the same, usually on the, on, 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 uh, on the outlook with the same kind of mentality. So we are kind of stuck in patterns of response. And I mean, it's clear you've been involved in in some sorts of activism for many years. We've been, if you look at the last four decades or so, a lot of people have, have invested energy on change, but we are in a worse place now than we were 40 years back in the 70s, where we could really have hugely significantly shifted our direction mm -hmm. and not be where we are today. So would love to really invite you to share a bit of what do you think are the kind of aspects of the systems and of our own place in the systems that keep us stuck in these dynamics that we keep keep moving forward in the direction that serves nobody or very few people in the planet and particularly not yeah. the planet itself <laughs> yeah let me start by saying a, a little piece of history from philosophy of science that's very relevant to this which is 
why Charles Darwin is described as one of the most important contributors to science in its history. And um, it's because prior to Charles Darwin's work, people who were talking about the patterns of living systems did not have a, a way of describing cause effect relationships. And so they were really bad at their methodologies for their philosophies. They had a lot of ideas like Lamarck was famous for saying, the giraffe stretches its neck to get to the food and that's how its neck gets longer, but he didn't have a, have a good cause effect mechanism. And what Charles Darwin did was he meticulously spent decades looking at cause effect mechanisms in the real world, looking at beetles and sparrows and finches and worms and other things. And I think this point of view of looking methodically at the world and trying to understand the cause effect mechanisms is really, really important for why our social change efforts have failed. And so I'll give an example of, um, of a, a problem that we have, which is related to scales of cause effect relationships. Because one of our problems is that the cause effect relationships happen at multiple scales at the same time, and they're different patterns. So one of the biggest changes that's happened uh, in human history is on the scale of geology and climate systems, which is roughly 10,000 years ago, we entered a warm stable period called the Holocene. And if you look at the archeological record, within the first thousand years of this Holocene period, agriculture began to take form in multiple places around the world. And then eventually empires formed in multiple places around the world. And eventually those empires wiped out conquered, displaced, absorbed, and destroyed most indigenous cultures on earth. And so it's easy for us to point at one empire system and say it's bad, but what we can actually see is there is a geologic cause effect pattern of creating a stable warm period when in the previous ice age, which lasted a little over 100,000 years, is when the first evidence of human, truly modern human creativity emerged of ceremonial burials, of symbolic art, all of that is roughly in the last 100,000 years. So humans became anatomically modern humans during the last ice age. And during our first stable warm period, a model of civilization emerged that actually emerged in many places. So we have this story of a cause effect relationship between evolution of human symbolic capacities and then a climate a situation that enabled those capacities to form complex human societies. Most of us talking about problems in the world today are not thinking that deeply back in time. And so we're not looking back to see how our ability to create symbolic cultural systems can create a mismatch between the evolution of human culture and the evolution of the biosphere itself. And so they're not looking at those cause effect relationships. And so this is a way of thinking that goes to large scales and to deep time that enables us to see root causes. And so that's one way that we can see something like another big change that's happened that most of us aren't able to wrap our heads around and we can't wrap our heads around it because it's too big is what happened with the discovery of fossil fuels. That roughly 200 years ago, a completely new model of social organization came into being that depended on a non-renewable resource, which we've nearly depleted. So we're coming to the end of the fossil fuel age and there's nothing we can do to stop it from ending. And so a lot of people are trying to figure out how to continue this model of social organization with an ephemeral and temporary period of depletion. And so this includes the exponential growth of human population in the 20th century and the green revolution in industrial agriculture both of which would have not been possible without fossil fuels. And so, so we're in this weird time where we're trying to solve problems of causation without having a multi-scale way of thinking about causation. We're not able to think in geologic time or evolutionary time, which by the way, for human evolution to get to this point of symbolic culture, there's about a 6 million year story our most common ancestor with the other great apes is about six million years ago. The first evidence of symbolic metaphor is about three million years ago with the development of Stone Age tools, seeing a rock and projecting a metaphor onto it of it being a cutting tool. 
And so we're looking at this multi-million year evolutionary process that gave rise to our present predicament. So I, I say it this way because when you, know, you ask the question of how do we see these structures that we're trying to work with, and how do those structures keep us from solving problems? One of our problems is a linguistic problem, which is we don't have a language for cause-effect relationships that lets us even see this. So we're, most of us are flying blind. Yeah, so it's like lang language calcifies things, right? It fixates things, and you're, you're giving this perspective that I think is really important, that we always need to see things in movement because everything is in flow. If we don't see the movement, then we don't understand mm -hmm. the patterns and the relationships, and then we have a very limited capacity to understand what's really at stake, right? Yeah, and also there's a kind of entrenchment that occurs. So let's take um, well, like fossil fuels and you know, the steam engine and the industrial revolution and the big story of techno-political change. It depended on a really powerful innovation of the 1470s that happened in Venice. That I think it was Stephen Johnson wrote a book called something like uh, The Invention of Ideas, um, which, which tells this story. That's where I learned this, I, this story. Um, but I think he got it from some other research. Is in the 1470s in Venice, there were these merchants who were managing large cargo supplies from ships. And they needed to have a way of managing who owes whom money. Someone comes in and buys something from the cargo ship or someone invested in the, the fleet of ships six months or a year earlier, and now they're gonna get what they paid for. And they needed a management system for this. And they created something that was completely novel at the time, which now is known as double entry accounting. You track the profits in one booklet and you tra uh, track the costs in another booklet. And you enter the value in both places. Well, double entry accounting is what made pop possible the invention of corporations. So there was a management system for tracking investments so a group of people could invest together. So it's not by accident that in 1499, the first stock trade company was invented um, in, in the Netherlands, this uh, Dutch tea company, which was a group of people could create profit and loss sheets for 10 people or 100 people to track their investments. So notice how this ability to track investments creates a cause effect environment. People can distribute risk, which is an effect of managing the investments. They didn't have the management tool with this accounting system, they couldn't track that risk. That's what allowed the scaling of management, which gave rise to corporations. It's also what gave rise to governments for national, um, uh, for, for, for nation states. So nation states use the same accounting system capabilities that corporations did. So it's not an accident that corporations and nation states became deeply entangled with each other. And then later comes the industrial revolution and fossil fuels, which become activated by these scalable management systems. So if we don't understand these cause effect relationships in this developmental history, here we are in the 21st century grappling with something like corporate money influences government decision making and all of it is around profit and loss which converts the entire planet into a system of commodities which destroys the entire biosphere what's the result human extinction and so this pattern needs us to understand these cause effect relationships and so if i'm an activist doing something like trying to protect the rainforest in the amazon and i have no understanding of the cause effect relationships of scalable accounting and the deep integration of na national governments and corporations, I'm gonna work at the wrong level of causation. I'm gonna try to stop something like this mining company is gonna come in and extract something and that's gonna destroy this forest. And I have no understanding of the deeper patterns of causation that made that happen. Which means even if I stop it in this valley, there are 10 other valleys that the same thing's happening in but I don't see the larger system. So my success is overwhelmed by the larger systemic pattern. And all of us doing um, systemic social change, we live in this paradox. So it's, it's, a, it's a really big struggle for us. Can I, so I'm, I'm curious about that example though, you know, I mean, listening to this and, you know, 
realizing complexity science is is you know what one of the things that that's at the foundation of of your own learning and deep understanding of things so help me to to to, to parse through this because part of what i've learned about complex systems is that cause and effect is really quite hard to understand inherently because of, of all these feedback loops right and 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 so you look at the the Canavan framework, for example, right? If you're working yeah. in the complex domain, you you can't assume that you can map cause and effect, so you have to use a sort of probe sense respond kind of an approach. So there's that sort of question about yes, it's useful to recognize all of this complexity in this deep time in this history, but what does that actually mean here and now for this valley with this mining company, and and the other piece I'll just bring in to to is is you know. Um, Naomi Klein wrote so powerfully about this idea of blockadia, right? That that particularly indigenous groups, frontline communities around the world, everywhere that these that these activities are happening virtually, this this immune response is, you know, as, as Paul Hawken would say, uh, is showing up in in resistance to it. And so yes, it it may be true. Of course, it's true systemically that you can't just stop the mine in one place, but it but is it also perhaps true that we're stopping it, or we're at least we have the the infrastructure emerging, the natural human response emerging to stop it everywhere as some kind of, you know, self-organized Gaia level response that isn't from people doing a, a causal systems map, you know, which also has its place as a strategy, perhaps, you know, I'm thinking of reamp success in stopping coal fired, you know, power plants in the Midwest, for example, based on, you know, real hardcore analysis there. And I think there are real limitations to that approach too. So, so I don't know what you, yeah. how you want to riff on all that, but. Uh, yeah, well, one thing that I think is really powerful is what happened with the development of digital computers and how it made it possible to study complexity. Because one of the things that was developed is, um, became known as cellular, cellular automata. And now the common name for it is agent-based modeling, which is ways of creating rules of interaction for some quote unquote agent, because it could be many different things depending on what someone's studying. And then they look at the rules of interaction for those agents. And then they design games right based on the rules. And then they look at patterns that emerge. And one of the things that comes about is that there is a distinction, a phenomenological distinction between upward, down, uh, upward causation and downward causation. And when we're able to clarify this, that there is a difference between upward and downward causation, then we can look at the relationship of each of those as phenomena to a given situation. So there might be a specific valley where there's a mining company doing something and a resistance to it. And we might ask, what is the downward causation? Which means what are the entrenched structures of the system that shape what is and is not possible to do in this valley? So there might be specific historical relationships of land grabs and inequality of land ownership, for example, that are structural uh, restraints within the context. And they are having a downward causation effect. They are the system, in a sense, opposing or oppressing or limiting what can happen. And then there's upward causation, which is about how do we change our local interactions to alter how the global system behaves, which is where a lot of community organizing happens. And when one happens without a good understanding of the other, it, there's a blindness that occurs. And when there's an awareness of both, then the pathway is more, I'd say there's more potential of transformational change. So it's partly about recognizing that there are different kinds of causation in play at the same time, that when the community organizers or the campaign designers, the people who are trying to create the change, if they are astute observers of these different kinds of causation, they can hold the paradox. And we see really good examples of that when it occurs. Um, and then you have things like, um, I remember Glenn Page telling me a story. So Glenn Page is, uh, I think, Ben, you know him personally, right? Or maybe you don't, but he lives in Maine. And, oh, you should know about Glenn Page's work. He, he was among the first people to create training programs in, um, in uh, coastal estuary restoration, doing conservation management for coastal estuaries. And that, that body of work required this upward and downward causation to be held. And 
Glenn Page has worked closely with Steve Waddell on the transformation systems forum, the SDG transformations work, um, where I'm sure you have a lot of overlapping friends. And Glenn told me a story of um, something that happened in, I want to say it was Sierra Leone, but I, it might have been Ghana. I just don't remember because uh, he told a few stories around the same time. I'm blending which one it was. But he told a story of doing a redesign of the political economy of a coastal estuary, where they basically looked at the, the levels of decision making across the government and a kind of ethnographic study of how the actual fishery was managed. And one thing they noticed in the local interactions that was turned out to be really important was all of the men had the fishing boats and all the men went out and did the fishing while all the women stayed on the beach and kind of sold fish as local merchants and received the fish from their husbands and they came back. And in a superficial way, you could think that the men were the one managing the fishery. The men had the fishing companies. But it was only by sitting there and watching the patterns and interviewing everyone involved that after six or seven months, they started to notice that the women were the business managers. You know, the men went out and got the fish while the women were preparing to manage the market that day. And the women were giving, were talking to the other women, gathering market research and telling the men what the women were learning about where the other men got their fish that day. And you found that actually the women were the business leaders, but it wasn't visible as an outsider. You had to come in and observe and learn it. And then by observing and learning it, they realized that they needed a fisheries council with these women. And they knew this because they were doing a structural analysis of how policy making was done. They found that there was a funding entity within the national government that was not being informed by what these women knew. And so a lot of that money was being misallocated. So there was sort of a structural causation of an inadequate policy making environment. And there was an upward causation of collective intelligence among these families led by mostly women on the beach in the morning having conversations with the other women while the men were out fishing and then feeding forward the intelligence to the next, next day's fishing, including where those women set up their fishery shops, where on the beach where they set up their little, you know, their little push buggy of fish or whatever they had that helped them serve their fish that day. There was a dynamic creativity there. And so the discovery was that there was a specific intervention. If they created a fisheries council that could pull forth the intelligence these women had, that they could start to change the ownership and management of the fishery through those women and their families that could receive funding from the national government. And as a result, in the span of two or three years, they changed the, the whole management system of the fishery. So upward and downward causation were both incorporated into the process. And this is because people like Glenn Page had learned complexity and had managed both patterns of emergence and ethnography and anthropology research and policy analysis and structural causal mapping. And so there was a team of people doing all of this together. By the way, this has a name. It's, it's called developmental evaluation. So anyone who wants to go and look at it, Michael Quinn Patton is the person named for convening this body of methodological design of developmental evaluation that does this work. It's managing emergence with top down and bottom up both incorporated. So, so you can see how the problem of not understanding causal mechanisms both made people blind to these mechanisms, but those, of, those who are studying it or advanced practitioners bringing together scholarly research began to incorporate the knowledge and create really effective pathways through. So it's not top down and bottom up, it's the third way which is managing the emergence of bottom down and top up, or top down and, and bottom up together. Like reconciling, reconciling those two. Yeah, it's a paradox that is reconciled yeah. in practice. And, and I know Ben is, um, you're, you're swimming in this body of practice. A lot of it is actually what you do. And so I'm just sort of naming back and honoring that because it's, this is so important to understand that one of the reasons we've failed for so long is the lack of this coherent understanding of cause-effect relationships. Yeah. But as we're getting better at as bodies of practice, it's, it's... The simple version is, <laughs> story is patriarchy's fucked everything up, right? Of course the women are the ones that are really the glue holding it all together. And they probably know that either, you know, consciously or intuitively. <laughs> 
And the only reason you need Glenn Page to come in and fix it all is, is because all the resources are held by the powerful men at the top, and so you've got to renegotiate the system, exactly. right? And yeah. we've had that analysis for 40 years, and somehow just sort of wishing that all away, you know, or just going to war against the patriarchy has only gotten us so far. It, it reminds me of, of our conversation you know, with, with Glenn Bur Guy, Guy Burgess yesterday, where there was this sort of balance between, on the one hand, um, you know, the need for, for things to, for existing systems and institutions to be taken apart and, and put back together in new ways. So things need to fall apart and we need to be putting pieces back together. But this fear of Humpty Dumpty, where if it falls apart too much, we can't put it back together. You know, we need the top down bottom is that somehow we need to engage with what we've inherited through this deep time of history. We can't just sort of magically wish for some, you know, other world than what we what we've collectively managed to to produce. And yet, so so there's just all of these challenges in accepting that working within those confines, you know, seeing what's wrong, what's broken but also, you know, some acceptance that, that, that actually this is also part of who we are. I don't know, this, this, I'm not fully articulated, but I think it's captured in the bottom up, top down tension as well that, um, and where activism can get stuck, right? That if we go too radically into just othering and blaming and being at war with all that is wrong in the world, that doesn't get us to, you know, that's fine if you wanna just break things, but if you wanna build new things together that require more or less all of us to collaborate globally it's probably not going to be enough, you know? Yeah, the way they talk about this in complexity science is there is symmetry breaking, which is how structure emerges in any system. That's a, a system level pattern. And then there's local rules of interaction. And it turns out the local rules of interaction give rise to the symmetry breaking, but the symmetry breaking constrains how the rules of interaction play out. And they both happen at the same time. And so there's a flexibility of holding paradox, which is a psychosocial developmental capacity. Let me unpack that. Psychosocial developmental capacity. People have to learn a psychological capacity to hold nuance and uncertainty. There's a social capacity to encourage and support that during times of hardship because uncertainty and confusion create anxiety and cause some people to want to reduce their anxiety. So there's a social support for holding the psychological development. And it's a developmental process because humans don't have this when they're young. They have an innate capacity to develop it. And so it needs to be developed. And so there's an educational implication there. And um, you know, great work done in the book, The Nordic Secret, talking about the philosophy of Bildung, which is a German philosophy of human development. And I recommend the Nordic Secret for anyone who wants to dig into that. It's basically a way of looking at human development across the lifespan. And integral psychology, for those who are interested, is a more recent expression of that idea, where, where we develop increasing nuance and capacity through psychological and social development processes. When we hold this in place for systems transformation and this question of conflict management, Something that I've discovered is really important is the relationship between grief and trauma and what um, is sometimes called liberating structures, which is basically we have structures that oppress us. This is in the racial justice domain is where this really came about. There are structures that oppress us, but because of our own grieving and our own trauma, we're actually oppressing ourselves through psychological feedbacks and through social feedbacks because we often find ourselves in things that actually are oppressive. It's not just that, that it's in our own minds. And the way beyond the, this situation is paradoxically to go into it and then transform it from the core. And there's a really clear way of understanding this because this can sound esoteric and be confusing. There is a body of research called positive psychology. In positive psychology, they ask the question, how does psychological thriving occur? one of the things that was discovered is something called post-traumatic growth. Because there's this thing called post-traumatic stress, PTSD. And post-traumatic stress is when you have a traumatic experience, afterwards you re-experience the trauma and it continually re-traumatizes you. Mm -hmm. So the question of post-traumatic growth is when someone has a traumatic experience, how does it make them more resilient and more capable? Because sometimes this actually happens. And the way it happens, um, 
Now, I know I'm throwing in a lot of words here, but the, the, tech, the technique for it comes from cognitive behavioral therapy. So those who understand cognitive behavioral therapy will understand this, which is basically a person has a story about how the world works and who they are. And I'm gonna give a really dramatic example. Imagine there's a young woman who's raped when she's like 14 years old. So she has a story of being a rape victim. And this story creates psychological stress that reintroduces the trauma. And from within the story, she can't change the story because her own grieving process is inhibited by the trauma. She's in a stage of grieving where reminding herself of who she is, being a rape victim, reintroduces the trauma and suppresses the development of healthy response to trauma, and she stays in a stage of grieving. What cognitive behavioral therapy would be would be to have someone who's outside of that story that re re reproduces its conditions of trauma and asks questions about the story. Like, I noticed you were saying this about your victimization. Is that really true? And then from within the story, this person can start to realize that they are living a story habitually and that they can choose to change things about their story. What they're doing is they're creating a scaffolding around the story. The story of victimhood creates a place for them to create a new pathway of growth. It's where like, they can go. If yeah. I understand correctly, Joe is like shifting from uh, being, uh, uh, having our, our actions uh, defined by what we want to avoid at all costs of not getting into traumatic situation again mm -hmm. and starting to understand that and shift to these are the things I want to bring to life. So it's like, because yeah, we can very easily, if we are deep, deeply traumatized and in shock to really get stuck on what we want to avoid at all costs. And then all our stories, a, a repetition of that until we actually yeah. can free, which is looking at what is really that's one right. affirm in life. Is, is, that, is right. that in practical yeah, that's right. terms? Okay. And then also there's this thing about relational frames, which is you reframe your relationship to yourself. So I'm no longer a victim. This is an important step, right? You create, victimhood is now a concept so I can reflect on it as an object of thought, which creates an emotional distance, which allows me to be a different self who is meditating on victimhood. Now I have an emotional space to begin to manage my emotions. From this space, I can start to transform my story. I am a person who has been victimized so in, this, in the example I was giving, I'm a person who was victimized by rape. Well, now I have a pathway of empowerment because now I can become someone who can use this traumatic experience to help other people who have traumatic experiences. And I'm sort of uniquely capable, meaning I can help because I had the traumatic experience. If I didn't have the traumatic experience, I couldn't help. So I've now performed a kind of emotional alchemy I took a negative experience and reframed it as positive. I healed enough from the pain that now my scar is like a badge of courage and is a healing elixir for someone else. Yeah, right? I, I just, I just wanna add one thing, Joe, that perhaps you can also kind of refer shortly, but is this sense of, and I'm going to kind of uh, mention a bit of the works of, um, of Paulo Freire and the, yes, the, yeah. the whole idea of pedagogy of the oppressed because there's something more into this that you are telling, that is how we can work through trauma in a way that we understand trauma not like, you know, it's, it's the person, but it's a phenomenon that acts, uh, happens, emerges from an experience in a way that we can also recognize in us also the potential to be, you know, to be an oppressor. Because what happens often is we, we get caught in these patterns where oppressed often becomes the oppressor. And so there's this kind of thing of, you, as we yeah. shift the relationship, as, as we shift our understanding of our experiences and the relationships that are at the core of those traumatic experiences, then we also kind of liberate the, the oppressor because in a way that, that energy yeah. gets, gets freed, freed. Um, so, yeah, I wonder if we could apply that, you know, the, to the, the rape of the planet, right? The mining companies, the fossil fuel industries are raping our mother 
we have this collective trauma, those of us who are aware of, of how deeply destructive this is in the course we're on, we've got these oppressors, these oppressive systems, as well as individuals within those systems, we have to engage with and, and transform. And is there, is there something in what Nuno just named, you know, when you, when you take that analogy to that level that, that gives us some way at least to unpack what we're doing now that might not be working, you know, as Nunu framed yeah. it earlier, and it was during when we were recording or not, you know, here we are, you know, this, this res work of resistance and activism and imagining different ways of doing things is at least 40, four decades, you know, in the making, if not, if not more. And yet we're, we continue to accelerate in the wrong direction in so many dimensions. So what can we learn about, you know, what needs to fall apart, you know, in, in order for us to, to be more effective and as, as we continue yeah. to work? Well, one thing that I learned when I was doing frame analysis and I was working as part of the team at the rules, we were studying poverty, inequality, and climate change, sort of our, our primary focus areas. And one of the things I gradually came to realize was the work on political framing was actually work on cultural trauma. That all, I, and I developed a hypothesis that political activism is rooted in trauma and activism is a trauma response. And I started to see that as, uh, as something I was experiencing because I was studying discourse. So it might be 10 million people all talking about the same thing. And if you start to look at the patterns and under the patterns are psychological phenomena, I saw a lot of trauma. And so I started seeing that reframing discourse was cultural healing, at least that's, that's the attempt. And then it mostly didn't work when we were doing it. And so what I started to do uh, was I started to look at the stages of grieving and I started to reframe my own messages to exclude everyone that was early in their grieving process and have those that were late in the grieving process self-select in. And I did this in a specific way that really upset a lot of my friends. So around 2017, I started doing this. Um, I, this is also when I started to, I'll, I'll put my fingers up and say, I started to become famous. I started writing blog articles that would virally spread and several hundred thousand people would read them. And so I was becoming a public intellectual, becoming famous. And because I study discourse, I watched the discourse around my own articles. And I watched a pathology emerge because the scale of the discourse was too large. I was talking about cultural trauma with no, man no ability to therapeutically manage 100,000 people. And so I was basically creating, I was re-traumatizing people with a story of healing. And yeah, I could opening see it wounds, the structure. Opening wounds you cannot heal in that thing. Exactly. And so what I decided to do was to start writing about what I thought was important. And the way I did it was, I only wanted to talk to people who were ready to have the conversation I was having. And so I didn't want all the people who were reacting like, Joe's a white guy, you might be a, a white supremacist, uh, sexist, racist, blah, 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 insert, insert my oppressor trauma. It's like, I was like, I'm not having that conversation. I had that conversation 10 years ago in my life, but that's not where I am. I'm having the conversation around nuanced systemic patterns and you can't have nuance when you're in that trauma response. And so what I did is I started writing about planetary collapse. And planetary collapse happens to be true and real, but most people aren't ready to deal with it because they're not at the stage of grieving yet. And so I started writing about planetary collapse where I went from 100,000 people reading my article to 500 people reading my article, but they were all the right people. Meaning they were all people that I wanted, I actually wrote that article for them. Mm -hmm. I wrote it to have a conversation with those 500 people. And you know, I was clumsy at first I had to learn how to do it, but this culminated in me giving a workshop, a five day long, face-to-face -face workshop called Managing Planetary Collapse, where the title itself will piss a lot of people off. How dare you say you can manage collapse? How dare you say collapse is happening? Like it would basically cause a lot of people to self-select out and very few people would self-select in. And then I would have 20 people come to this workshop for five days and we would form deep transformational relationships because we were all ready for the conversation. And so this is how I learned to practice regenerative, regenerative design in a psychosocial context. 
And so, so you can see how important it is to understand the grieving process and the trauma process to be able to manage a discourse. But also now that I've got this Earth Regenerator Study Group, which has grown to 1300 members, and we're creating a curriculum or a, a design pathway together for regenerating the Earth, that this knowledge of grief and trauma and how to form functioning groups, um, which is why I'm working so much with the pro-social framework, which is a tool set for creating effective groups. Um, and it's actually really an amalgamation of a bunch of people's knowledge about how to form effective groups. Yes, and then they yes. call we, 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 interviewed, we interviewed Paul Atkins. He's going to be part of the Beautiful. fourth week. And I know Ben has gone through one of the trainings and can see like, yeah, I already do a lot of this. And at the same time, I'm glad you're doing it. Like, so we're kind of blending a set of tools here. And what comes out as really important is therapeutic facilitation is much more important than people realize much more important than people realize that if we're going to regenerate the biosphere of the earth but then we have to do exactly what you said we have to go into this oppressor context of how did we create a human culture that has raped the planet how do we do that well there's therapeutic facilitation for how to do that but we have to do it to ourselves for ourselves with each other to be mm. able to do it so this I'm fixing the problem that's out there is misframing the problem <laughs> in a really fundamental way, which gets back to that discussion of causation. If I don't understand the causal mechanisms of my own grief, I cannot participate in a regenerative way in the problems I'm try trying to solve. Yeah, so there's this yeah. kind of sense of turning the, the, the lenses to, to ourselves. And that also for me is, and, is bringing us to the inside of the system because there's often this sensation of that the, the, the disconnection goes also to the level of saying, I'm disconnected from everything that made this world the way it is. And I'm just a, a kind of helpless, uh, helpless victim of all this. And, instead, and, and this allows us to shift into what is happening inside of me that is kind of shaping how I show up and then what is my role within the co-creation of the system? So to look from a third perspective, but inside the system, not yeah. as something out, out of it. <laughs> and there's a specific insight from anthropology that is a spiritual lesson. So the insight from anthropology is 99% of human history, all of our ancestors were indigenous hunter-gatherers. So every human on earth is an, is an ancestor or is a descendant of indigenous. So I'm indigenous, you're indigenous, all of us are indigenous. The problem is because of that Holocene pattern of empires and civilizations, for most of us, our lineage is broken and we've forgotten our history. So even though I am indigenous, I'm also from the United States, I'm from a white Western culture, the Western philosophical tradition, so I embody a culture that is not indigenous, but most of my ancestry is indigenous. So the challenge is, how do all of us become the ancestors of the future indigenous? Mm -hmm. Joanna Macy has talked about this very powerfully. And so the midwifing process that Joanna Macy talks about is in many ways is talking about this, is how do we become indigenous when all of us are the descendants you know, if I'm not purely indigenous now, it means that I am the traumatic victim of a dominator culture killing my own indigenous ancestors. So I'm not the white guy oppressing, well, I might be the white guy oppressing you, but I'm also the white guy oppressing you because of Paul Freire's um, oppression dynamic, is I actually was oppressed, but, but I forgot. Because it might have been, you know, my, my ancestors are from, the area around Italy, they, those indigenous people might have been killed 4,000 years ago. So I have no memory of them, except I have a genetic memory of them that you do the population genetic history, you'll find that I'm part of a bloodline of that part of Europe where at one time there were indigenous people. And eventually you go back and up in time, all of us are Africans. And so this, this understanding of cultural indigeneity and this relates to something that I want to name that's now future oriented, which is the idea of bioregional scale, regenerative economies, how to create economic systems that are regenerative. 
which is the way to keep humans from going extinct and how to heal the planet. It turns out a bioregional economy is just a subsistence hunter-gatherer culture that we've modernized. So the only sustainable cultures in human history were trade networks of indigenous people who had completely local material flows. All of their building materials are local, all their clothing is local, all their food is local, but local means regional because they traded with neighboring tribes. Yeah. So this model of subsistence trade networks, today we call that bioregionalism. It turns out it is a regenerative cultural system. It's a biomimicry model of a living system for human culture. The only living human culture in history that is truly regenerative is bioregional, which it turns out translates to it's the, the only cultures in human history that are sustainable are the indigenous cultures. That doesn't mean we need to kill off all non-indigenous people. It means we need to re we need to enact like you enact a play, we need to enact bioregional cultures. What that means is all of us become bioregional. All of us become indigenous. So before we started recording, Ben was eating an everything bagel and we were laughing about how the everything bagel was this blend of globalism for supply chains, but also a deep indigenous ancestral culture because the Jewish people once upon a time were indigenous. And so there's this blend. What's funny is, yeah, Ben, you said, I'd love to have an everything bagel where all of, the, all of the grains on my bagel are local. Well, then you would have an indigenous bagel. <laughs> you would have a bioregional bagel. And so you can see how creating these local food systems and these local supply chains, which is the direction sustainability work has been going for decades, um, that is becoming, that's a pattern of becoming indigenous. But we have to let go of the hubris of the noble savage. The idea that there was this garden of Eden with perfect indigenous people and all of us from the oppressor culture just need to basically slit our own throats and get out of the way. <laughs> That's dishonoring the indigenous in both directions. It's not an authentic picture of true indigeneity. It's a romanticized version, like the way pornography is not healthy sexuality. We don't have a healthy relationship to the indigenous with a romantic and false view of them. But we also have a false view of indigeneity if we don't see that we are indig indigenous too, but we're in the process of becoming indigenous and it's multi-generational. Yeah. But once we see that, we can honor all of these traditions and create the new thing at the same time. So just let me bring to our attention that we are kind of really on the, on the limit of time for the interview. And there's still a couple of things uh, that I would like to invite you to, to talk about, Joe. Just as a sum up, we touched upon many things, but I would say uh, as, as kind of highlights of this and looking at opening up our understanding and our consciousness of, of the history of place, of people, and so that we can get a sense of movement and not look at things like stuck or, 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 or for frozen. And so that's really important to be able to, to be in relation with living process and living systems. And then you, we, the need to work on these different levels of scale. And we were talking now about the originalism, and, but that means that all of us need to do a kind of three, level, three lines of work personally on what am I, what's, what's are my inner conditions in my relationships with the environment and with the people around and how my place can then contribute to this bioregion and, and the economic e ecosystem balance and regeneration. And then I wonder like one of the things we haven't touched yet is like how to, because this, this involves each one of us contributing to a fundamental cultural shift and, and a, a, a shift in consciousness. So perhaps you can talk a bit like how, what insights you've been having on that. We talk a bit about cultural scaffolding. It's worth maybe exploring that a bit before we close. Yeah, one thing I wanna say is that um, because of that top-down constraint of how structure emerges in the whole system and how the local interactions then become constrained, that many of us are stuck within social uh, patterns that are collective patterns, they're institutional patterns. And so they're very difficult to change. 
But if you step outside of them, you're immediately isolated and alone. It's sort of like if you are an Inuit in the igloo during the dark time of year, and you step outside of the igloo, and all of the elements you're now exposed to, and the cultural protection has been taken away. So what, what this says is that you do not have um, what cultural evolution researchers call, you don't have cultural scaffolding. You don't have the social supports to live in the environment because the social supports evolved for that environment and they're part of the culture. If you step outside of the culture, you let go of those social supports as well. And so like take my example of how I never got a PhD because each time I looked back at the limiting structures of universities, it's like, well, I don't really have support to do my academic work outside of the university, but I would rather not have support and have freedom than to be constrained so much that I actually have no freedom at all. And so the question became, how do I create the support, social supports or how do I find them? And we have a really concrete example of this or a, a theme that my family is working on because our daughter is three years old and we're trying to raise our daughter in a regenerative way. And I actually just gave a webinar last weekend about parenting for earth regeneration. So this is a lively topic. Is let's say you're a parent of a small child or you're a young person considering having children. And you're aware of, you're what I would call collapse aware. You get the way of this planetary scale ecological crisis. You don't wanna participate in the consumer economy. You wanna raise your children to be um, net positive for the planet. Now they're not just recycling, they're actually regenerating soil. They're not just um, being nice to animals as pets, but they're preserving and expanding biodiversity. Like they're net positive for the planet. So now as a, as a person trying to ask, where do I live? Are my spouse and I aligned on this? What kind of schooling do we have for our kids? What kind of work do we do? Do we buy a house if we have the money or do we do something else? All these life decisions. And what I'm finding is all of these parents or potential parents, they don't have the cultural scaffolding. They don't even know the questions to ask and questions are a kind of conceptual scaffolding. But if they had a mentor, someone who's maybe one or two years ahead of them in the process, who's figured out the questions to ask, they can ask those questions to them. Have you considered this? That's a question. And so this cultural scaffolding, these social supports, which are relationships between people, are where a lot of this cultural transformation gets frustrated and doesn't happen. People see too many choices and they don't know how to make them. Or they're not connected to someone who can give them good advice. Or everyone around them has pathological behaviors, and so all they see is what they don't want, but they don't see what they do want. Yeah, and you so remind this, me. Yeah. You remind me of this funny. expression from Margaret Tweedley of the creating islands of sanity. Yes. So how we yes. can hold these spaces where we can embody different ways of being in the world together. Yeah. Exactly this. Margaret has nailed it with that metaphor, because we're we're creating archipelagos of culture. Because mm. here's the thing about an archipelago that takes Margaret's metaphor and goes one level deeper. Um, not that she didn't think this, but just it's not said in that statement, which is why are there these islands of coherence? Because there's a plate tectonic pattern, a fault line that is forming all the islands. And all of the islands are connected by the same deeper pattern of formation. And so those of us who are designing for cultural change, we don't just find the islands of sanity. We go to the deeper levels of pattern formation and say, what is the plate tectonic? You know, Hawaii is a chain of archipelagos. All of the islands are formed because there's a fault line where all of the magma is pushed upward. And as the tectonic plates move, more islands form. So how do we do that plate tectonic work for creating islands of sanity? So what, what, are, the, what are the fault volcano? lines of our society, right? Yeah. What are they? But I also because, see you as a volcano, Joe, right? I mean, the, <laughs> the larger shifts are happening and then, you know, Who's the source of the magma that can actually build the island yeah. that we can stand on? And, and you know, that's, that's where I see the, the, the struggle and the beauty and, the, and you know, the, the pathos in your, in your whole story. This, this, you know, you as the outsider witnessing and understanding and seeing the system from a, you know, from a level that, that is not generally being appreciated and, you know, the both the, the incredible value that brings, but also how challenging that, that's been for you in so many contexts. And I think there's a fractal of that 
for all of us, you know, working for this systemic change in the midst of a dominant paradigm that's generally seen as broken, but, but you know, the answers mostly we're talking about and reaching for are taking us backwards and are trapped within that old thinking still. Yeah, I invite you to yeah. wrap, wrap up also, Ben, so that then Joe and I can also wrap up. That, that's well, my wrap up. Okay, thanks so much. <laughs> Joe, you wanna you wanna say something before we close? Like something you feel really important to to leave our audience with? Yes, I want to give a brief lesson about compost, because <laughs> part of our grieving process has to do with death and permanence. And if you study ecology, you will learn about something called ecological secession, which is they're pioneering species that enter a degraded environment, but by their own decomposition, as their bodies break down they place the nutrients in the ground for species that can that could not tolerate the more degraded environment and this creates a pattern of secession where new species enter and replace the old species that entire pattern has a name it's called composting all of the nutrients are recycled into the bodies of other organisms now think about cultural composting we have a huge infrastructure. The bigger this global system is that is dying, the more compost we have as it dies. So instead of trying to keep it alive because we're afraid of death, as my friend Martin Kirk, who I worked with at the Rules, he said it so gently. He said, I'm not fighting globalized neoliberal capitalism anymore. I mean, I'll help it, I'll help put it to bed. But what I'm really doing is trying to midwife the new. I was like, I love that. We're putting it to bed. You know, yeah. we're giving it hospice care die gently with honor and dignity, but die. Well, and die. take nutrients from it, right? It, because we, we can give the nutrients. money is evil and we won't <laughs> touch it. That's, that's, yeah. that's nutrients to recycle. Exactly. And our biggest body of nutrients, our metaphorical currency is not money. It's actually land connected with mental awareness. You know, what's called the newosphere, the collective aggregate of human attention. If human attention is directed toward land-based processes, water moving through the land, microorganisms and mycelium in the soil, cultivation of root structures, hydrological cycles and canopies of forests. If we can put our attention into land-based processes, then we can create regenerative economic systems because that productivity of the land is where our, our construction materials are for buildings, natural fibers for clothes, our food. The human economy has grown from that. So our two biggest assets in the world are degraded land and human attention. And if we can organize those, then monetary systems and other things will just flow through them. We, and you know, Ben has been involved in some great collaborative finance projects recently that show these tools exist. You know, I know you've been involved in this, eco-village models and other things, they exist. But if we don't recognize land and human attention, are our most important assets, then we don't know what to direct into this future development. And what is hospice? There are two things in hospice. There's the body that is dying, translation, degraded land. And there's the love and care, the attention, the mental awareness and focus of giving compassion to what is dying, which Thank is so honoring much. what it's becoming because that body is becoming new life. Thank you so much, Joe. That's a perfect uh, way to, to finish. And I was thinking like, maybe the new kind of activism, activism is compost activism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, definitely that's a great, a great um, ending. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ben, for joining me in hosting this conversation. Uh, get a look at the Joe's work and uh, the uh, Earth Regenerators community on Mighty Networks if you want to be part of this um, composting and this uh, cultural scaffolding that, that we are all together operating. Thank you so much for being with us. Yes, thank you. Lovely to be here.